Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh <coughs> Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin Wassalatu wassalamu ala rahmatillil alamin Wa man tabiya dinahu bil ihsan ila yawmiti All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And may Allah's peace and blessings be upon his final messenger The mercy of this universe The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And for everybody who follow his way with righteousness until the last day. The topic I have chosen for this session is a glimpse at the life of Aisha binti Abi Bakr radiallahu anhuma. I have chosen this topic because very often when we discuss the biographies of scholars, we focus on the biographies of the male scholars. While Islamic history is also rife with many female scholars of Islam who serve as role models not just for Muslim women but also for the Muslim men as there is much that we can learn from their lives which apply to both genders. Aisha radiallahu anha was perhaps the most prophetic of such scholars as she was the wife of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She was one of the early scholars of this Ummah being from the Sahaba and she is a woman whose scholarship is agreed upon by the scholars of Islam. The ulama have agreed upon her high level of scholarship. So who was Aisha radiallahu anha? Aisha was the only wife of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu to be born into a Muslim home rather than converting to Islam. She was born approximately three years after prophethood in the home of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. So she was the daughter of the greatest man after the prophets. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, the greatest of the Sahaba. Aisha was his daughter. And she grew up around the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa because her father was the Prophet's best friend. Aisha radiallahu anha, we do not know much of about her life before she married the Prophet as she married the Prophet وسلم, at a very young age. And this age in recent time has been deemed problematic by many non-Muslims in that it does not agree with the customs of marriages of modern people. To be precise, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he wedded Aisha when she was six but they only consummated the marriage a few years later after she had attained puberty. So, this marriage in modern terms seems problematic because of the culture we are used to, we are accustomed to. However, when you look at it in the historical context, there was nothing wrong with it. Because at that time in Arabia, it was normal for people with such dif different age groups to get married. It was normal for men or women to get married at a very young age. People used to mature a lot faster in terms of their mental capabilities as they were raised to be husbands and wives. And so at a younger age they were more prepared for marriage. If the Prophet Muhammad's marriage was something bad, his enemies would have been the first to jump on it. But not a single enemy of Islam at the time picked on his marriage to Aisha. And if it was something bad, it would have affected her in a negative way. Normally, when a young woman is forced into marriage to someone who she does not like, or she is forced into marriage at a young age when she is not ready, she grows uh, intense dislike for that individual who she is married to, and it stems into hatred, and this is seen in her life later on. But with Aisha, and the Prophet Muhammad the case is the opposite. 
her love for the Prophet ﷺ grew so much that she became his most beloved wife. And even after the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ had passed away, she became one of the leading scholars to propagate his message to the world, showing that she was a mature woman who studied from the Prophet ﷺ and loved him so much that she wanted to be one of the main propagators of his religion. So this marriage is something no Muslim should feel ashamed about or to try and distort historical facts about. It is something that was a blessing for the Ummah. Aisha anha was the third woman that the Prophet Muhammad married. In the early part of his life he was married to Khadija bint Khawalid radiallahu anha and he remained in a monogamous marriage with her until she passed away. After she passed away, he married Sauda bint Zam'a radiallahu anha, an elderly woman, to help raise his daughters. A few months later, he had a dream in which the angel Gabriel presented to him Aisha as his bride. And as we Muslims know, the dreams of the prophets are revelation. So acting upon this dream, he married Aisha radiallahu anha and she became one of his wives. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu had many wives. This is something which all historians agree upon. And his wives were the best of women. We call them Ummahatul Mu'mineen, the mothers of the believers. They were the role model women of this Ummah. Aisha was one of them. There's nothing wrong with the Prophet Muhammad having many wives. This was something which is normal and amongst the Prophets and amongst the people of that time. Islam came and put a limit to polygamy and said men are allowed a maximum of four wives if they can treat them with justice. But an exception was made for the Prophet Muhammad He had up to nine wives at one time because he was the Prophet of Allah and he was able to do justice between them and each of those marriages played an important role in the da'wah and in the political situation of the Ummah and most of these wives were divorcees and widows whom he had been assisting and caring for. Aisha was the only virgin bride of the Prophet Muhammad Every other woman he married was either divorced or widowed. So this automatically made her seem like the special one. And his love for her grew very intensely. So much so that Anas ibn Malik narrates that the first example of true love we Muslims saw was the love between Aisha and Muhammad His love for Aisha was so much that the other wives could see it, even though he treated them with equality and justice, but they could see his love for her. And when he was asked to be just in his love between his wives, he replied that the hearts are, by, are controlled by Allah. Whatever is in his capabilities, he is just with. But the hearts are in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and love is something that Allah controls. Once a sahabi by the name of Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu asked the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa who is the most beloved person to you? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said Aisha. So he said, I'm talking about the men. The Prophet ﷺ replied again and he said, her father. So from here we see that the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, not only did he love Aisha, but he was not afraid to express this in public. We find many stories of the love that occurred between them. We find that Aisha anha, and the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, they used to race with each other. There's a narration that when she was a young bride uh, during the early years in Medina, when returning from an expedition, she and the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ stayed behind. And when the people had gone forward, they raced each other to catch up with the rest of the people. When they had reached the people, Aisha had won the race. Many years later, <coughs> she had picked up a bit of weight. And now the same situation occurred. And the Prophet ﷺ decided to race with her again. And this time he won and he told her this was for that. So it is a very friendly, a very loving relationship that they had. For example, on the day of Eid, Abu Bakr walks into the house of the Prophet ﷺ, into Aisha's house, and finds that some girls were playing with drums 
the hand drums, the duff, and they were singing some songs. So Abu Bakr got very angry and told them they cannot do this in the house of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ told Abu Bakr anhu that it is a day of Eid, let him have fun. So Abu Bakr left and the children continued to play with Aisha anha and sing their songs. After these girls had left, Aisha and the Prophet ﷺ went outside to the masjid. And in the masjid there were some young Abyssinians who were playing with their spears, putting on a little demonstration. So the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, he held Aisha in a way that she can see properly what was happening. And she, he kept standing there with Aisha in his arms until she was tired and she had had enough and she had enjoyed the entertainment and was ready to go back. So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu we learned from this, not only was he loving to his wife Aisha, but he also took out time to have fun with her and to, en to enjoy some entertainment with her, which is something which a lot of people don't realize is part of Islam, that marital couples need to spend time having fun together. That time must be made. We, you need to take up time for your spouse and enjoy time together. This is something which is from the Sunnah. Now Aisha radiallahu anha, she was the most beloved wife of the Prophet sallallahu but despite that she would still get jealous of his other wives. And she was most jealous of Khadija even though Khadija had passed away before her. The reason being that the Prophet sallallahu loved Khadija a lot. So much so that the scholars differ on whether he loved Aisha more or Khadija more. So Aisha narrates that no woman made her more jealous than Khadija even though she had never seen her. Because every day the Prophet Sallallahu would talk about and talk good about her. Until one day Aisha got angry and she told the Prophet Sallallahu didn't Allah give you something better than her? Talking about herself. And the Prophet Sallallahu he got angry and he replied that Khadija believed in me when nobody else did. And Khadija was the one who assisted me with, with her wealth and she was the one through whom Allah had blessed me with children. So from then Aisha realized that she should not speak about Khadija again. I'm bringing up this story to show that the Sahaba who were the greatest of humanity after the Prophets, they were also human and they were also subject to the mistakes of human beings and to the emotions that the rest of us feel. Sometimes we paint too beautiful a picture of the Sahaba until it seems unrealistic and it seems like something we can't follow. But when you look at Aisha radiallahu anha and the other Sahaba, they were humans like ourselves, but they strived to be amongst the best. And as a result, because of this, Allah elevated their status. There are many other stories of her jealousy, which shows some of her human mistakes. For example, once when the Prophet ﷺ and some of his guests were in her house, and one of the other wives had sent some food uh, for these guests, she got very angry as to why she was sending food in her house and she threw the plate and it broke. The Prophet ﷺ did not scream at her, he did not shout her, he did not get abusive or vulgar, as was his nature, he was the mercy to this universe, he was the mercy to his wives as well. And he simply laughed and he told his companions that your mother is jealous. And so he told Aisha to replace the plate and that was it. End of the story, he didn't blow it out of proportion, understanding the human nature, and understanding the nature of co-wives that they will be jealous of each other. So Aisha Rajal Anha, she was a human being like us, but she strived. She strived to be the best. And she was a very gifted woman in terms of her intellect. And this can be seen from the fact that not only did she narrate many narrations from the Prophet ﷺ, but in many of these narrations you will find that not just narrating, but questioning as well. If the Prophet ﷺ would say something, she would ask a question to clarify it. And it was this questioning nature of hers which led her to gaining even more knowledge. That the scholars of Islam know, uh, deduct from her life and the life of other scholars that one of the signs of a true student of knowledge is the ability to ask deep questions which expand upon the issues being discussed. So when the Prophet ﷺ narrated to Aisha the hadith that on the day of judgment humanity will be raised uncircumcised and naked, 
Aisha radiallahu anha asked the question, that won't people be looking at each other? A very good question. And the Prophet ﷺ replied that on that day, the affair will be so severe, people will be so scared of Allah, they won't even think about looking at each other. So, from her question, we got to understand just how scary the Day of Judgment is. But it was these type of questions that led her to become a great scholar. We find that the age that most of us spend in school and in our studies, she spent this age in the company of the Prophet Wasallam studying under him. So from the age of 9 until 18 or 20, she was in the company of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. So when he passed away, she now had an ocean of knowledge, which she began to share. Not just with the female companions, but even the male Sahaba and the male Tabi'een used to come and study underneath her. And she used to teach them from behind the niqab, but they were those who were mahram to her, and they would study with her without any hijab. As the best example of this was her nephew, Urwa bin Zubair, radiallahu uh, anhu, was from the Tabi'in. He was the son of Aisha's sister Asma and husband Zubair bin Awam. So Urwa wanted to go and study Islam and he asked his father who is the best scholar for me to study under. And Zubair told, her to go, told him to go and study with Aisha because Aisha was the greatest female scholar of her time. And Urwa had an advantage the other men did not have. Aisha was his aunt, so there was no need for hijab, so he could study underneath her in a much more personal and direct manner. So Urwa began, began to study under Aisha and became one of his, her closest students. And he narrates that he had not seen anyone with more knowledge in hadith, tafsir, fiqh, Arabic, poetry, or even medicine than Aisha. And he had very high respect for her. So this was Aisha Rajana, she became one of the greatest scholars, she became an advisor to the scholar to the Khalifs after the time of the Prophet. And there are many other great stories about her. Indeed, we can spend many hours just discussing her life alone. One story about her life that stands out and is perhaps the most often discussed story is the story of the great slander, Hadithul Ifq. In this story, it happened during the lifetime of the Prophet. Aisha radiallahu anha, she was on a journey with the Prophet and as they were returning from her expedition, she left the camp to relieve herself. When she was coming back, she realized that she had dropped her necklace and she went back to pick it up. While she was gone, the people did not realize that she was gone and they continued with their journey as she was in a hijab type of carriage on a, and this carriage was being carried and so people they could not see inside and they thought that she was inside it. When it comes to the life of Aisha Radil Anha, one story which is most famous about her is the story of the great slander, Hadith Al-Ifq. Once while on a journey with the Prophet وسلم, Aisha Radil Anha, she went to relieve herself and due to a misunderstanding the caravan left without her, thinking that she was inside a hodaj, inside her carriage. When she returned to the place where the caravan was, there was nobody there, and she was now alone in the desert. So she sat down on a rock and she began to wait. She fell asleep, and while she was asleep, her niqab came out, and one of the Sahaba who stayed behind, he came riding up on his horse, and he saw her. And he recognized her because he knew her from the days before the laws of hijab were revealed. So he just said, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. And she immediately woke up and covered her face. And without speaking to each other, she, he let her get onto his horse and he walked and took her back to Medina. So from here we can see the piety not just of Aisha but of this man as well. That they, they didn't even speak to each other out of fear. Not just of what could happen, but what people could say, because this is the wife of the Prophet and people are looking for, to try and tie fault to him and his family. So, in the most purest manner possible, he took Aisha back home. But the leader of the hypocrites, Abdullah bin Obey, he saw this. And he decided to use this to his advantage to try and slander Aisha. And so he began to spread a rumor that Aisha and this Sahabi had, na'udhu billah, then some kind of sin. And this rumor had spread. 
Aisha was very sick and she was in a home for a few days and she did not know that this rumor was spreading. When she finally found out about it, she went home to her parents and she says before that that she realized the Prophet ﷺ was being a bit cold, he wasn't as sweet as he normally is and she couldn't understand why. When she heard about the rumor, she finally understood and she asked permission to go to her parents' house. She went home and asked her parents if it's true that such rumors were spreading and her parents said that yes, such rumors were spreading and they were very sympathetic and she stayed there and she began to make dua. The Prophet ﷺ, he went around doing some research and investigation to try and find out if there's any truth to these rumors and he finally came to visit her and speak to her and her family and her family did not know what to say so she said that I know that I am innocent but people won't believe me so I leave my affair to Allah, Allah will help me and after that the verses of Surah Nur were revealed Surah Nur about 10 or 20 verses Surah Nur clarifying the life the name of Aisha Radha, declaring her chastity and condemning those who accuse her of any kind of sin to hell. When these verses were revealed, her parents told her to thank the Prophet ﷺ and she said that she will only thank Allah. Now there are many lessons we can derive from the story. The first lesson is that not only is it important to stay away from sins, but it is important to stay away from such situations or circumstances that can help, that can make people accuse you of sin. Because if people see you doing something which can be interpreted in the wrong way then they can very easily misconstrue the situation and attack your name and defending one's honor and keeping a good keeping an honorable face in public is all part of the deen the next lesson we learn from the story is that the covering of the face was something that the wives of the Prophet ﷺ used to do Scholars differ on whether it is obligatory or recommended. I personally follow the opinion that it is recommended. It is not an obligation. But it is something they used to do, definitely. So for those Muslims who try to stop women from covering their face and claim they are not from Islam, this story is very clear that Aisha used to cover her face in front of men who were not related to her. The next lesson we can derive from the story is that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he did not know the unseen he did not know the unseen except what Allah revealed to him and this is very important because there are many Muslims who think that the Prophet وسلم, had blanket knowledge of the unseen if he had blanket knowledge of the unseen he would not have worried he would not have changed his attitude he would not have done any investigations and he would not have waited for wahi he would already have known that Aisha was innocent but he was a human who received revelation and only whatever revelation he received that was the amount of the unseen that Allah allowed him to know the next lesson we learn from the story is that gossip and slander are from the worst of sins that affect our society there is a narration that says that backbiting is worse than zina and really here we can see the effects of backbiting how it ruins the lives of good people that they can be a good man or good woman in the society but people would lose tongues talk ill about them spread rumors about them and this affects their lives and it makes life difficult for them Aisha Radulana was not the only person to be afflicted by rumors there were others who were afflicted so badly that it even led to their death we look at the life of Imam Bukhari Rahimahullah in the final years of his life some of the scholars who were jealous of him began to misconstrue some of his statements and spread rumors that he had wrong aqidah and so wherever he went people did not want to listen to him as these rumors had spread before him finally Imam Bukhari rahimullah, raised his hands and made dua he said oh Allah your earth is vast but it has become narrow for me so choose me for yourself take me to you and one month later, Imam Bukhari rahimahullah, passed away. What led to his death? Many of the scholars say it was this slander, rumors, gossip 
unfounded accusations. If he can affect the lives of so righteous people like Imam Bukhari and Aisha radiallahu anha, what about us? What about your neighbor? What about your family members? So this is a warning to every single believer to control your tongue. Be careful what you say about others. The Prophet Muhammad said, Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir fal yakul khair aw yasmut. Whoever believes in Allah and the last day should either speak what is good or remain silent. That is the way of the believer. If what you are saying is not good and beneficial, don't say it. Don't speak about others. In another hadith he said that from the perfection of Iman is to leave things that don't concern you. Don't get involved in other people's lives. Who is committing what sin? What is the latest gossip? What is the latest rumors? This is evil and this destroys society. Stay away from this. Stay away from these type of things. This you can learn from the story of the slander of Aisha radiallahu anha. There are many other lessons which other speakers might be able to extract and other authors would have extracted as is the nature of the stories of the Sahaba and the Prophets and the great scholars of the past that their lessons are not limited. Aisha radiallahu anha, another amazing story in her life happened after the death of the Prophet wasallam. At the time of Usman radiallahu anhu, towards the end of his life there was a great fitna. And in this fitna it actually led to many Muslims or so-called Muslims attacking him and assassinating him. At this point in time Aisha radiallahu anha, she was in Mecca performing the Hajj. Usman was in Medina. So the people of Medina, they chose Ali to be the next caliph. And Aisha and her companions in Makkah, they were of the view that Ali should first bring the murderers of Usman to justice and then they will accept him, accept him as the caliph. And so Aisha, عنها, according to one of the narrations in Bidaya and Nihaya, she went in front of the Kaaba and she delivered a lecture about the virtues of Usman. And she rallied the people to go and speak to Ali about this issue. And so, so Aisha radiallahu anha, she left at the head of an army with Talha and Zubair by her side to go and speak to Ali. Note that their intention was to speak to Ali and to discuss the issue, not to fight with him. When they reached there, they had a discussion and they came to some peaceful agreement that they will accept him as Khalif and then he will do what he can to bring the murderers to justice. Some of the hypocrites who were in the army when they heard about this peace, they decided to plot and start a war. And so they split themselves up into either side of the army and began to attack each other. This caused a battle to break out between the followers of Aisha and the followers of Ali. And in this battle known as the Battle of the Camel, both Talha and Zubair were murdered and Aisha, she was on her camel in a hodaj and in order to stop the battle, Ali had his men attack the camel so once the hodaj fell, people stopped fighting and that was the end of the battle, Aisha and Ali came to peaceful terms and that was a regrettable incident amongst the Sahaba going back to what I mentioned earlier that the Sahaba radil anhum were humans and they made mistakes and these mistakes cannot be held against them. Indeed, we have done a lot worse in our lives to look back at the one or two mistakes that great scholars and great Sahaba had done and to hold it against them. Aisha radiallahu anha in her army was Talha and Zubair, both of whom were given the glad tidings of Jannah in this world. And Aisha herself was praised in the Quran. And Ali himself was given the glad tidings of Jannah. So on both sides were righteous people. And we look at them as our righteous Sahaba and we say for each of them radiallahu anhum and we do not attack their character in any way because they were the Sahaba they were much more righteous than us and whatever mistakes they made we just make dua may Allah be pleased with them and may Allah have mercy on them so this was Aisha radiallahu anha a very short glimpse at her life we looked for a short while at the slander incident we looked at the Battle of Camel, a very brief rundown. Really, the battle alone can take one or two hours to discuss with all its lessons. Then, 
We also look at a marriage. I'd like to conclude with one more story. The story of Aisha Rajal Anha when she passed away. It's also, I read this in Bidaya Wa Nihaya, that when Aisha Rajal Anha was passing away, Abdullah bin Abbas Rajal Anhu requested permission to visit her. So he came by her bedside and he spoke to her and she said that she was fearing Allah. And Abdullah bin Abbas said, good news to you. She said, why? He said, because you are the one who Allah has revealed verses about you, clarifying your name and these verses will be recited till the day of judgment. And he mentioned all the good qualities. He said that you were the only virgin wife of the Prophet wasallam, and you were the most beloved of his wives and you were a scholar of Islam and you were the only one in whose house revelation would descend when the Prophet wasallam was sleeping in your bed. And many, many other virtues he began to mention of Aisha until she said, I wish I had died before this or was something unknown. This was paraphrasing the words of Maryam salam mentioned in Surah Maryam when she was pregnant with Isha, with Isa alayhi salam and going through the pains of labor and think about people will say when they see her with the baby how will they react she said the same thing I wish I had died before this or I was unknown so Aisha Rajala anha she passed away after this and from the story we see the high respect that Abdullah bin Abbas and the other Sahaba had for her because Abdullah bin Abbas himself was a scholar of Islam the great Mufassir of Islam and he is also a scholar of fiqh but he also looked up to her as a scholar he also had great respect for her she was from amongst the mothers of the believers one of our mothers uh, another lesson we can extract from this story which also can be taken from the story of Hadith al ifq is that Aisha radil anha she had such a strong connection with the Quran that many a times her words, her speech would be from the Quran so during the incident of the slander, when they asked her what she had to say, she simply said, I say what the father of Yusuf salam said, that فَصَبْرٌ Jamil وَاللَّهُ الْمُسْتَعَانِ عَلَى مَا تَصِفُونَ That patience is beautiful and Allah's help is sought against what they are saying. So she, her words were the words of the Qur'an. Likewise, when she was passing away, her words with the words of Maria alayhi salam mentioned in the Quran. So she had a strong connection with the Quran that she was able to quote it like that in her own speech for her own answers. She would quote Quran. And this is a really strong connection that we all should try to have with the Quran. So the life of Aisha Raja Anha is a very vast topic. And there is a lot that has been narrated about her in the, in the various books of history which inshallah we can discuss in more details on a later occasion this was just to give a glimpse at her life to get people interested in studying her life in more details and to extract a few basic lessons that both men and women can follow and to live by Aisha Rajal Anha is proof that a woman can be superior to a man in knowledge and in piety and there is no such thing in Islam that men all men are better than all women or as some people think that women are deficient no Aisha Rajal Anha she was a proof a love, she was a proof who lived in this world that a woman can reach the highest levels of scholarship she can be extremely pious she can play a role in politics and she can be remembered as a righteous Muslim for all time after her so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help the women of this ummah to follow in her footsteps to help the men of this ummah to follow in the footsteps of her husband the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and in those issues which are general to help both the men and women of this ummah to follow in the footsteps of her and her husband the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and to become just like them and to be able to not only extract lessons from their lives but to apply it in our own lives till we become walking examples of the sunnah وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم ورحمة